Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. If you're looking for the next best thing to invest in, try investing in your long-term health with Forward. Forward is intelligent medicine with a personal touch. Their doctors are dedicated to catching top killers like cancer and heart disease early, which could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. So invest in a doctor that's invested in you. Visit GoForward.com to learn more about how Forward can help you manage your long-term health risks for one flat monthly fee. That's GoForward.com. To the sweet sounds of Kevin Bloody Wilson off my iPhone, it is hump day with Swanee and friends, Dane Swan, and guest friend with Samantha, selfishly, being on maternal duties, mm. Joe Watson. Hello, mate. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Uh, you two got a little bit in common over the journey. What? <laughs> <laughs> You're different type of personalities, but you got a bit Brownlow in common. Brownlow medalist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember playing against Swanee in 2005. I was playing for Essendon VFL. So he was playing for Williamstown out at Williamstown Oval, and what, uh, a blo- what a beautiful oval that is! Yeah, beautiful windswept. Oh, <laughs> but we probably our careers went probably going in the direction <laughs> either of us had hoped, and <laughs> thankfully we were able to uh, rectify it and turn Oof. it around. No, no, no the days, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a well, ground! We'll reboot it. Well, C-Pies. So your Williamstown reserves reserves so theory, started, just yeah. for people who haven't heard this. What, what you, you said. How many people were watching you in Williamstown Reserves Reserves? Well, if you um, if you believe what most supporters tell me now, about eighty thousand. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. Like, I remember you. Like, that's funny, old mate. I knew you were going to make it from day one. I was watching you down in the Williamstown. <laughs> thought, yep, you're going to be a player. I said, like, bullshit. Um, <coughs> oh, mate, I didn't even think I was going to be any good. None of my parents didn't think I was going to be any good. Let alone the four supporters who were watching the reserve reserves down at um, Point Jelly Brand at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Um, but we all got to start somewhere, yeah. don't we? I yeah. remember a greyhound came onto the ground one time I was playing there. <laughs> and the guy I was standing next to, I said, why doesn't someone try and catch it? He goes, it's a fucking greyhound. <laughs> no one's going to catch it on the ground. The best thing about Willie was um, Harold from Neighbours was a... Um, was a big fan. Oh, was really? a supporter, yeah. Oh, yeah. He used to sit in the crowd and, and watch. Um, that was my first introduction to um, stardom. Yeah, <laughs> running past, walking back into the race and seeing Harold just um, just standing outside. It's fucking Harold from Neighbours. <laughs> um, I've made it. You know, when Harold was coming to watch me, but actually those were the days. Um, it should be our 20-year reunion coming up. Of? Of our premiership, by 2003, yeah. Yeah. So I won one down there. Is that well? Surely that won't be another function you miss out. Given well, I, we've missed out on our um, ten-year AFL reunion. Yeah, yeah. Um, God knows when that's going to happen with what's going on in the world, but um, I'm sure Colin will do one because footy clubs <laughs> like making an earn off <laughs> premierships. So um, at some stage, we'll I'd imagine we'll have a, a function at the um, like at the Crown or somewhere because 1990 missed out too. So they had their what. 30, 20 year reunion We had it meant to have our 10 But um, Obviously the world being how it is um, We haven't been allowed Which sucks But um, but yeah What was your equivalent of Re- Williamstown Reserves Reserves When you thought Probably not Where I Where I need to be Yeah uh, career, career, what, what do they call it? Career trajectory <laughs> <laughs> Yeah it was, We used to have to We were uh, affiliated with Bendigo For a period of time oh, It's a tough drive and, and We were doing the, you know, the Sunday morning we are in a mini ba- mini bus going up the highway to Bendigo and I thought, uh, hang on a minute, this isn't what I thought AFL football was like. I'm going to do something about it. I, yeah, I remember kicking the dew off up at uh, the Queen's Elizabeth Oval up there and thinking, God, oh, I'm a long way from anywhere. Uh, but sometimes it's character building, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, you absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> you need yeah. to be at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. We, never, we didn't get it easy. No. Um, but I didn't mind it in my first couple of years because I don't know how Essendon had to do it, but we didn't have to train with the seniors or anything. We just had to train it. We had to come in and do weights, which I thought I took that as being optional. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, they'd obviously have their, obviously train during the day. They'd be like, all right, just come in, do your weights and go to Willie. So we have to be at Willie like five o'clock or something like that. Mm. So, mate, you'd sit home all day, 
<laughs> pop you out into the footy club, like do the Homer Sim- you know, the Abe Simpson app, walk in, put your hat on, then just walk straight back out. <laughs> then race over to bloody Willie, and I guess how the probably sums up where I was. We'd go go over to the chicken shop, eat chips and gravy <laughs> and like a chicken roll or something before training, go out, you know, have a kick in the freezing cold conditions. And then play for Willie the next day or two days later, and then I, wouldn't, man, I would hardly seen the senior blokes because then we'd have our own rehab. Like we'd, we'd be on our own schedule because the, the ones obviously played in different spots and they'd have their own schedule. And Mick um, only wanted the the senior group to train with each other and didn't give a shit about us. <laughs> Kick, kicked me off the track more than once. <laughs> what was your equivalent? Yeah, we, we used to go to the social club at Windy Hill and have uh, chicken uh, schnitzel sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> free training. And there'd be guys making requests for no salad on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Just chips, gravy and chicken schnitzel sandwiches. So good, so good. You wonder why you're not feeling great when you're running around at 3 o'clock training. <laughs> yeah, skinnies weren't a... <laughs> I always had a quiet the issue with skinnies, but um, went real high on my list of priorities of getting down yeah. the skinnies at that age. And, and were you straight into the senior team, or was it, or did you have a year apprenticeship as well? No, nah, I was. I played one game in my first year yeah. um, in the AFL, and then um, uh, maybe five or six second year. And my, by the third year, I was sort of um, going nowhere. Like that was sort of where we you like you're three years in the system, and you're running around in the twos and you're thinking, oh, God, I'm a, you know, this is not going well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was probably back then, you're a bit more fortunate, though. They, there's a bit more leeway with the contracts and stuff like that. Like, you, I had a, uh, I had four years, really, like before you, you sort of got an opportunity to either get flicked or not. So they gave me, uh, nowadays, I don't reckon you'd get that sort of luxury where you did back then. Unless you're a ruckman. Yeah, unless you're developing <laughs> tall yeah, or something exactly. like that. Yeah, you get eight, pr- eight years to prove you, you can play and you, know, you can't play and everyone else gets two years to prove you can. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was exactly the same. Uh, so fast forward to now, as in post career, just while while we're in the yep. pandemic and everything else. So we we and this is part of the reason we're doing this. Obviously, send out everyone who's who's in a shitty lockdown at the moment, but uh, particularly those hit in um, in hospitality and in fitness. Um, tell us a couple of areas you've been uh, working in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I do feel for everyone, um, you know, specifically in those industries and. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, I've got some businesses in New York who are one in hospitality and the other one in fitness as well. So <laughs> chosen two good industries to be in when a uh, pandemic arrives, um, and and they've been I mean the American how they've done they've they had a different approach. I mean they were heavily locked down um, you know in the early part of 2020, um, but then their their vaccine rollout's been you know really really um, far more progressive than what we have here, um, and so they're. Now at the stage, I mean, New York just mandated that you can't enter a um, a restaurant or a theatre or a gym without showing proof that you've been vaccinated. Um, and that's the, I mean, the expectations of people living in New York is that uh, people are, go- are vaccinated. I mean, it's a very sort of left place and, and progressive sort of democratic, um, you know, area in in the States. But that that is where they're at. They, they, they've sort of seen it as we can't, return to a COVID normal or, or a normal life without um, mass vaccinations. And that's been the philosophy of them. And the Americans, you know, they don't they don't sort of wait for things to, you know, they get out in front of stuff and, and they do it and they... Very similar to here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot of choice when when, <laughs> things, uh, when, the, when industries and things like that want to do things, they they, they get it done, and, and uh, that that's been the approach. But there's been you know times where we've had to let um, a lot of staff go and, and shut the doors completely. Yep. Um, thankfully, though, uh, you know there's been a lot of government support as well over there. When's the last time you were there? Uh, I wasn't there. I haven't been there since 2018. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I doubt I'll be there until probably 2023, I reckon. So in your head, in your head prior to pandemics and all that, what, were you going to be a two-country sort of person? Or Yeah, I would I would like to. And then my, my sort of partner wanted to get on the, the kids' train and, and we sort of decided to settle um, – predominantly here in Melbourne. Is she American? She's Dutch. Dutch. So, um, but she'd lived in New York for, for six years and, and uh, New York was sort of home for her. Um, and then she was, she made the um, decision to come out here and, and uh, 
move her life out, out to Melbourne and, and I was sort of keen to go back to New York yeah. and she was like, well, <laughs> I've picked everything up and come out here for you, so um, let, let's sort of stay here for a while. Um, You're stuck now anyway. And, so. I, and <laughs> there's no reason <laughs> to go anywhere. So uh, Melbourne is home um, and then probably I'd always like to have that connection to, to New York and then obviously Europe is, is home for her. Um, what, and what what is what is home for you? you two kids, yeah, yeah, two kids. So we're uh, we've got um, Juniper who who turns three in September, and then uh, Wolf turns one in October. So uh, yeah, I was saying to to Swanee, you know, recent father, that <coughs> everyone kept telling me that there was a bigger jump between one and two than there was from zero to one. And I was like, there's no possible way it could be any harder going from no kids to one kid. And then I've had two and I've realised, yep. I don't know how people do it. (laughs) No. Shit. Are you Uh, from family two kids? Pardon? You're you're from two kids. Yeah. Yeah. You're from four. I'm from four, yeah. yeah. And you do get a greater appreciation (laughs) for particularly what your (laughs) mother did for you. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, Two. I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, unlike uh, Tim and Susie, yeah, you, you've ha- become a dad at an older age too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it was the um, you know the generation before us. Mum and Dad were had us when they were twenty three. Yeah, you know, and and I wanted to experience life a bit more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> but you were gone as a twenty three year old. Well, man, thank God we did. Yeah, yeah because exactly now, right. well, yeah. thank God I and I, I don't know about job, but I chose to. Well, my foot kind of made a decision for me, but thank God I got to retire and then a bit like Joe, travel the world and have three or four years where I could pick up and leave because if I'd, I'd hate to be retiring nowadays, Phil, because yeah. what you do is when you finish footy, you go, all right, I'm going to have a year and go see the world and you're stuck here now. So I'm quite thankful that I got to do some amazing things after footy now. Obviously, the family life's stuck and I can't do anything anyway, so I was like, well, fuck it, I might as well have a family. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, it's... um. It's wild. So I have mine at, what, 37, so yeah. 36 to 10 days before my birthday. But um, it's just the generation. I think generations getting older for yeah. families now anyway. Like, like you said, our parents had us in our 20s and at 35, 36 is just normal for people having families these days. Yeah, there was always that... Uh, uh, you know, analogy that if you're sitting there eating your cornflakes, you want to be thinking back to the times where you had some good memories. So <laughs> yeah, the longer exactly. you're, you're left there, yeah. you're going to be sitting there at the breakfast table <laughs> with, yeah. with noise around you for a long time. Exactly, because people people always say, man, I can't remember what I did before I had children. Yeah. I was like, well, I can. Yeah. <laughs> I had a great time. That's literally all I think about. <laughs> sitting there cornflakes is what I did before children. <laughs> It's all I think about. So I I know exactly what I used to do. <laughs> I can't do it anymore, unfortunately. No. Uh, yeah, but post career, this is where you, you're very, very different. The two of you. I yep. found something very, very different. You're in New York, and a you sought out some war- work, <laughs> and b it was unpaid. <laughs> That's a oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so what was it? Well, my my reason for it was. I, I, when I was there, because I went in 2016 when I when we were banned, and I thought, look, why did uh, why did you choose to go to New York? Uh, I'd always wanted to live in New York, and I had uh, two friends who were living there, and I thought um, it's as good a place as any to go. Yeah. Um, and so I loved American culture, and I loved New York every time I'd been there. But I'd always had a, a desire to like live and immerse myself in a in an in a city. Yeah. Um, every time I travelled at the end of the season, I'd love it, but it was gone, you know, like, and you never really get a feel for a, yeah. a city until you live there. So New York was the, the place I wanted to go. And uh, and when I arrived there, after, you know, a couple of weeks, I realised that I needed some structure mm-hmm. in a week. Otherwise, things could get, <laughs> as you know, New York, there's a, there's a lot of temptations in New York and you get yeah. yourself into trouble. And I thought, I need I need to, to have some structure and I needed, and I wanted to learn a uh, new skill and I thought just something really simple like this would be really fun and it would be something really different where I could talk to people and engage with Americans and things like that and, and have just a bit of a, a very opposite existence to what I'd had in, in uh, AFL industry and footy um, and it would give me some structure each week and that was the reason behind it and I reached out to... Is it a hard skill becoming a barista? It took me a while. Like, I stuffed up a lot of people's <laughs> coffees. Yeah. Um, and, like, fortunately... You so, know, did like, you know a bloke at a cafe or did you just run into a random one one day and go, can I learn? So, the girl that I... Um, my friend who was there, she introduced me to the guy. 
Yeah. And uh, and Barry had this tiny little place inside a building. It was like an old news agency, and that's where it was, and that's where it started. That's where Hole in the Wall started. And uh, and I'd go up there um, twice a twice a week and, and do the uh, a shift for a day. Yeah. And uh, and I absolutely loved. Like we had a ball. You know, yeah. it was a real simple um, existence for me, but it was the that that simplicity of it and. <coughs> is what I really liked, you know, just engaging with people and um, and just having a, I guess, doing a job that you would have done typically if you were 19, 20 working in a bar, which you'd never had, I'd never had that experience yeah. and, and I actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> that, but they've got good forward defences, Americans. Did you ever think, fuck, a year ago I was out at the MCG and now I'm copping a gob for <laughs> fucking up a coffee? <laughs> well, I, no, I liked I liked that no one knew who yeah. I was or what I was doing there and no one knew the reason why I'd, I was in New York either. So um, I just uh, I really enjoyed sort of just chatting to everyday people and finding out, you know, because I love American culture. So it was about, you know, talking to people about where, they fr- where they're from, what they're doing in New York. And, and then it's a very... It's quite an intimate five minute conversation, and then it's gone, yeah. you know, and then you're on to the next one. But um, if you're working and, and you repeat the process with these people, you start to learn a little bit about their lives, and, and that's what I enjoy. Did you have any Aussies like just walk in and go, I oh, can't have a coffee and like give you the double look? Like, yeah, like Joe Watson. <laughs> I had a couple of people yeah. do it, um, but they were, they were fine, and I just sort of chatted to them about why I was there, and they were, you know, again, they were over there working or doing their own thing and and New York's one of those places where you get this uh, melting pot of like people from all over the world come there and they all want to make it there they've all got some story about why they're there what they're trying to do and it's a great networking city too you know like people yeah. will go I've got I know this person I can help you get that in that's that's American culture and that's why I think it's such a desirable place to go so uh, part of it was was Hutchie one of the hookups to say who, who should I speak to? Or yeah, well, I'd, I used to go to um, and catch up with Hutchie every time I'd go to New York. He'd be sitting there at his, um, his bar on the um, the West Village there. and Keeping uh, it up? Yeah, making sure that, <laughs> that it was still stocked. And <laughs> I'd always catch up with him when I was there. We had Christmas lunch there one day year, year when I was there with the family. So I had a lot of sort of like connections from New York and uh, and Hutch was a good one. Uh, and, and the fitness one, so was that you took that over to the States? Yeah, and yeah that, so the F-45 was um, what I'd done here and I remember going, you know, that Port Melbourne one that yeah. um, it opened up and I just sort of thought, oh, this is a really good opportunity to have something like this because I was doing a lot of training when I was in New York but there wasn't any sort of high-intensity sessions like that and uh, and so we thought, oh, look, let's... Um, I lived in Williamsburg and I thought it was a really similar sort of profile to to Melbourne and, and some of the areas that I thought, you know, F45 had done well in. So that's that was the reason for bringing it over there. And has it kicked? Has it, uh, yeah, it has. I mean, the, yeah. the pandemic has been... Yeah, yeah, it's been difficult for it. But it has... Um, it, it's it's gone well in in that sort of area and suburb. But there's a lot more competition in that space now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, off the beaten track. Are you a more an off the beaten track type of traveller apart from New York? Yeah, I um, I used to go with a group of guys, sort of four or five guys every year, um, and we would go all over the world, really. And and I loved to do different experiences. I loved to go to different cities, and uh, that was always, you know, like when I look back, that's the my fondest memories of that period of is the, the travel trips that I was able to go through. Uh, give us some Brownlow style, three, two, one. What were the best places? <laughs> um, I loved Berlin. We stayed in Berlin for a couple of weeks and I loved Berlin. I thought it was a cracking city. In um, the summer or the winter? No. Well, we were October, sort of it's September, October. So it was yeah. getting cold, but it had a great, you know, like, you know, when you get a feel for a place and you, you're there and you're like, God, this has got a real st- sort of substance to it um, and edgy and, and a lot of history as well. So I really like that. Um, where else was a, a good trip? Um, oh, like uh, Budapest, I thought was a, a good place. Like some of those European um, little cities. On the um, Swanee's waiting for you to say Vegas. Uh, well, Vegas was a, a staple. Um, yeah, but you sort of—I mean, Vegas is Vegas, you know. Exactly. Like you, yeah. 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 <laughs> I hate that, hate that place as much as I love it. Yeah. So, um, but I anyone suppose. that's been there, you're not telling them anything new about. Yeah, exactly. what, everyone who goes there knows exactly what they're yeah, there exactly. for. Yeah, um, exactly. 
The, Austin, Texas is a great city too. Well, it? uh, well it's got like, um, you know, you've got the Longhorns there, so it's a big college town. But then you've got the South. There's a lot of the feeling of the South there too. Um, great food and it always had a lot of fun on 6th Street. Anywhere there. where you're on holidays is fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah, it's, go, it's going through your mind a bit at the moment, isn't it? Oh, mate, I can't remember. The, well, let's um, the Joe, my, mis- my missus is obviously from New York, so she's hanging to get back. But, yeah. Um, God knows when that's going to be. So it just makes me upset thinking about when my next holiday is going to be because <laughs> I can't even go to Queensland, yeah. Ralph. So <laughs> don't worry about going to the other side of the world. <laughs> I did a uh, hiking trick in, trip in Norway. Yeah. And that was a lot of, like, that was off the beaten track a little bit. And a guy had told me about. As a uh, holiday? Yeah, as, a, as, a, as a holiday in the year off. with mates. No, but uh, I met I met a mate there, yeah. um, and this was in the year off, so I was sort of looking for stuff to do, and uh, and I met a guy, and uh, and he said to me, "Look, I did this hike in Norway, and these are the places that I stopped, and this is what, and that's what I did. That was a that was like something that you don't do every day, like, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Beautiful place, Norway." Uh, t- tell us the Iceland rot because I, I like this one. That that it, what is it? It's free accommodation if you st- if you go to Iceland. Yeah. But it's, it's the most expensive. It's the most expensive place in the world, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. nothing for nothing. It's free accommodation for anyone. Well, they, they allow you to have a free stopover if you fly Icelandic oh, Air. Okay. So we were flying uh, from New York to uh, Holland and they said, look, uh, you could stop for free in Iceland and uh, you get a re- reduction on your accommodation if you do that. And then you're there and a piece of toast costs you 22 bucks. <laughs> was it? I don't know. That was the toast. Was that Vegemite? <laughs> <laughs> they jam, jam on toast. <laughs> but it's like... Uh, they, they've also they've sort of called it this Frankenstein rule where it's the, uh, the monster you create because they, they obviously collapsed after the, um, the financial crisis. Iceland was one of the worst places oh. hit. And so tourism has been the thing that has just um, you know, kept the economy going. But everything's become so expensive. So now the locals struggle to, to live in the uh, place now as well. But it's a beautiful place to go. Do you recommend it? Going? I do, but it yeah. is, it's, I wouldn't take kids there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually, are you still an OTV type of guy at home? Ah, uh, yeah. Kids? No, I don't have TV. Yeah, don't, we don't have Ooh. one. Yeah. A what? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have what? Don't have a TV. At home? <laughs> don't have a TV, though. I've got a broken TV that sits on a shelf. <laughs> Trying to wrap my head around that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do all week? Yeah, do do? well, do do? I mean, we've got, like, devices and things like that that they use, but... Um, so like, you, don't, you haven't been watching the Olympics or anything? No, nah, I haven't seen any of the Olympics. I watch it like I've got, wild, man. I've got a game NFL Game Pass, which is yeah. all I really want, so, yeah. um, saying, yeah. and the NBA Game Pass There's as well. There's a game so. today, actually, no? Um, Dallas are playing. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're playing maybe the um, the Hall of Fame game or yeah, whatever they do. Yeah. Um, Hard Knocks starts next week as well. So. Dallas, Cowboys, Steelers today. Yeah. Um, fuck, that's why you don't have a TV. <laughs> you don't watch yourself back on your, when you're doing the Channel 7 stuff? You don't no, know. I'd hate to. Uh, yeah, no, nah, I don't do that. So how do you watch mum, your, mum gives me all the feedback that I need. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How do you watch all the footy to keep up with your... I've got a, uh, I've got a KO uh, a right. subscription so I can watch it on a computer. On, on my computer, yeah. And, and I feel like I suck saying this, but I've, I've known you for a while, a little bit. But um, but you, you are loving your, the, the special comments you're doing and the way you're doing it. Have you modelled yourself like a Tony Romo or other type of sports that you can say, well, I can, I can do it a certain way? Well, I, I listened to a podcast recently with Troy Aikman. Um, he did he did a, he was a special guest with Sean McVay, and um, and he just talked about the uh, like how he goes through it, and and I just try and um, you know have a. I guess a, a philosophy of you know just trying to explain the why of how I see it. Um, I don't like to be critical of people. I think that um, you know anyone can tell you what someone should have done or what they didn't do well. It's just trying to explain and um, I highlight the you know what what how great you know the game is and how great the athletes are that perform it. You know and and never forget how difficult it was. So I, I like uh, I like to do the commentary. I don't like to be someone who commentates uh, like a, about uh, the game sort of f- more than just what they're seeing on the ground. Um, so, all right. So I'm channeling our, our mate Scotty Cummings from our first year. Yeah. He had a good saying, I'd rather hole punch my ball bag. Um, <laughs> is that what you would rather do than um, than be on one of those paddle shows just bagging the shit out of players on a weekly basis? Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's you. No, nah, it's, not, it's not me. And, and I think that that's the thing. Like, you've got to be sort of true to what you... Like, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, then it's not worth doing it. So um, I, I, enjoy, uh, I enjoy the commentary um, and 
only, but only really commentating about the games. Are you in the studio or are you at the games? It just depends. All the international, all the uh, interstate. interstate were in a studio. Surely that's tough because if you got behind the ground vision and stuff Not really, like, no, nah, no. Nah. So it's you can only see harder. what we can see on the telly? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that would be tough, wouldn't it? Because you wouldn't be able to... You can't clearly sort of forecast yeah. what's happening. Yeah. yeah, and when you're at the ground, you could say, okay, well, this is what's happening. This is why it's up happening. This is yeah. why it's happening. Um, but then you've also got to. It's actually it's, it's it's taken a lot to sort of learn because you've got to remember. There's no point talking about what the audience can't see. Yeah, because okay, then yeah. it becomes sort of irrelevant for people. You always got to remember that it, it, what the audience is see is what you should be, you know, um, talking about, um, and then just trying. Uh, is that been an instruction? Um, well, no, not. I mean, it is. It's part of what what I think makes it relevant is you, you sort of go, okay, well, what is the, what are people going to connect with? Because you you're trying to just connect them to what they're watching, you know, and you don't make them, you don't want to educate them, but you don't want to force stuff down their throat. No, I, you know, I know it's a fine line because it's probably the only sport in the world where what's happening off camera is very relevant. Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's that's the thing, but it, you can't a lot of a lot of people just want to watch the game and enjoy it. Yeah. And, and but then there's the other side of it who want to know more about the tactical and so you've got a very broad audience that you're trying to cater to. But I think that if you can try and explain the the why of what what is happening, that that's what I try and endeavor to do. And what's been a surprise about doing that job? And oh, it's it's much harder than what I thought it would be. Right. Yeah, it's much harder to um, you know to be concise, to explain what's going on in the TV, to come up with new things all the time, to not repeat yourself. Like it's it's a real um, uh, there's a, and there's a lot of research and stuff like that that you need to do. After yeah. all the um, shit that happened with Essendon, did you think you'd be back in footy? Not or? really. No, no. I, I, I th- I thought that I'd probably move away from it. Um, and I like that I have a little bit of it, but it's not my life. Do you love the game like you did, or is it is sort of the passion gone after everything that happened? Um, I don't. I probably don't love it like a, a 16-year-old kid yeah. who dreamed about playing footy. Um, I've learned to sort of move on from what happened, but I probably, it doesn't have the same feeling to me that it once did. Yeah. yeah. And, and would that also be that now you're older and your parents and, you know, you've got other perspectives in life too? Yeah, I think the, the relevance of it, you know, when you're living in it, it's funny, you know, like it becomes all you really know and, and your whole world is surrounded by that. And then when you leave, you're like, God, there's a there's a lot of things that I was sort of probably too focused on and I should have had a bit more perspective. But if you're going to be good at something like that, it sort of demands that attention from you. Yeah. Um, and and I guess as you get older, you get a little bit more of uh, perspective of the rest of stuff on life. Yeah. Do you follow Essendon? Like yeah, Essendon? I, do. I still yeah. follow Essendon and it's more like for love of the, you know, the, the guys that are still there and, and then the supporters. I think you appreciate the supporters a lot more after you leave, yeah. I, I find. Like... The and especially how have the, they been with you? Yeah, they've been, I've always had a great yeah. relationship with them, and I've uh, I, I found them to be um, you know, and supporters of all, all clubs really have yeah. always been really well treated by um, all supporters. But the Essendon people, I think you get appreciation because you you realise how life how busy life gets. You know, when you've got work and you've got a family and all that sort of thing, and then you see the passion that these people have for the footy club. And you're like, God, you guys. <laughs> commit so much for me you know it was work and I was getting paid and it was a job and I loved it hmm. but for you you know like you, you <coughs> devote so much time money and energy into this club out of love and um, I think hmm. that that is really commendable have you been back um, I've sort of been there to visit a little bit but not nothing no. really yeah. um, they had an event at the start of this year which I went to but that's yeah. about it because that's one of the things I've, as a suburban footballer, <laughs> in, in quotation marks, but in reality, any old player is, was always loved and welcome and beauty, this is part of it, but you, it's not a workplace. Yeah. So, and I've spoken to many uh, mates who, are, who I've worked with or became mates with who were elite footballers or cricketers, and they just know that they don't feel comfortable being back in a 
in workplace environment un- under most circumstances, unlike a, a local footy club that most people listening to this would relate to. Yeah, I think there is a difference because of that. Um, and things, the professionalism of the, the clubs move on so quickly and, and the players change and turn over and staff turns over so quickly. So you can go back five years later and you go, oh, I don't really know many people here anymore and I feel mm-hmm. like a little bit of an outsider. And Is that um, what you felt like when you took the cab around earlier this year at Collingwood? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's obviously the same like the boot starter and like yeah. you know the property steward and all they're all the same but the admin staff is completely different and obviously the players which is the big one I don't even know half the people's names in there yeah and like yeah. six years ago you walk in you're like the Pied Piper you know yeah. like everyone <laughs> yeah. loves you and at this stage you're like I'm not sure they know who I am yes <laughs> and yeah. like I don't know who they are so it was it was a little odd but um but yeah exactly the same as Joe and I tried to purposely create a distance between myself and the footy club because I was such a big part of it for 15 years like and when I was playing like you'd see all the old boys come in and like sit and have lunch and it was fine for on the odd occasion but yeah. when they were in there every week you're like yeah mate if I could go do something else <laughs> yeah. like, your time's come and gone so I didn't want to be one of those old blokes who were hung around the club every day and trying to still think I was a part of the side because you know I obviously wasn't and they needed to to move on without me so that's I've tried to purposely cr- keep a distance and they they wouldn't have Wanted me back anyway, I'm sure, but um, <laughs> especially when Nathan was there. But um, <laughs> new coach might be different. But um, yeah, I, I purposely tried to create a little bit of a vacuum yeah. away from from the footy club. So on my list of things that you might have in common, uh, neither of you seem like you want to coach at AFL level. Just at a guess, no, I, I, I don't have that, that desire. I think the only thing I would say, like I loved the game growing up, and you know, yeah. like I always thought I would, you know, do it. Um, you know, wanted to play, and uh, you have so much so much knowledge about it um, that it seems like it's a bit of a waste to just like put it in the box and leave it yeah. um, so the only thing I would think about if you know coaching or, or getting back involved in is if I would sort of did a full circle and went and did other things in life you know had a family the family got older and then I went back to footy out as a real desire you know like if I was 55 or 60 yeah. um, but for me it was like part of my life that I needed to say goodbye to and move on and yep. the progressive you know progression in life meant that i couldn't stay in that industry uh, anymore i needed to to find something else i needed to learn some about other industries and other things hey just um last week and i was taking totally out of context we spoke about it with adam simpson about the private school comments yeah but but on the good side of it you know you obviously went to a great school and with a good family that's the only thing at a footy club Every, the only thing everyone has in common is that they're good footballers. Yeah. But did it really impact you and say, well, this is actually a totally different world now and, and you learn a lot more about different people and different uh, cultures, I guess? Yeah, yeah it, you do because, you know, everyone has their own upbringing and, and it is um, it can be very vastly different and, and that is the great thing about um, that, that team sport environment in, in the AFL is you get to... Um, you know, learn and educate yourself about other um, people, other uh, cultures, and uh, it's it, it helps you so much develop as a person. And that's what what I found is um, people that I hadn't had a lot of uh, interaction with or lifestyles with before I came to footy, I was able to you know get and build a relationship with those kinds of people. And I think that it it, it helps you have more empathy for other people, and it, it, it helps you get along with people which is actually really important in life is you've got to be able to cope and understand why someone's got to a situation that they are why they're making the decision that they are and if you ever if you you just stay in your circle then you you're going to really struggle to be able to understand you know the thought process of other people and i think that that is the beauty of sport it doesn't it doesn't discriminate and should never discriminate on you know where you were born what you uh, what your parents did, anything like that. It should. It's a. It's a beautiful level playing field. Yeah, and that's also a bit of uh, Sheed's DNA, wasn't it? To to uh, make Essen in a nationwide club and and yeah. also embrace the Aboriginal cultures and so forth. Like that. Did you get some real good insights and trips away and stuff like that along those lines? Yeah, we had a. We, we were really like the the work that the that Sheeds and the Footy Club had did in sort of these the eighties and. 90s and things like that like anywhere we went as a club we just had enormous support whether we were up in the northern territory or in western australia or south australia and that was built off the back of i I think his foresight into you know we need to 
sell AFL to the rest of the country, and we've got um, such wonderful, uh, uh, you know, cultures that we that can add so much value to this this game, um, and this game can um, showcase these cultures as well. And that's what football does. I mean, you, you go and watch, um, and we use the Indigenous uh, players out there. Like, they are the stars of this game. Um, and they do it, you know, they are able to then, I, th- I think it's a great avenue for them to then talk about Aboriginal culture and for, to help educate people on, um, you know, the Indigenous society through what their exploits are have been on, on the football field. Because really, in the 80s, uh, obviously, when your dad was a star, but Longy was almost the outlier, and now it's <laughs> now it's the norm for Aboriginal Indigenous stars all over the comp. Yeah, that's right, and, and uh, I think it's they, they are um, they add so much to to the game as well. Like it, it just they they offer such different dimension to what um, you know, like uh, other players can do. Uh, so so growing up, because we mentioned Sheeds, we should open the door. There, the, the perspective as a young kid and perspective as a player. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, she just uh, I had a hard, sort of hard relationship with him, yeah. um, and I, I often think back though and think that um, you know s- when you're eighteen, nineteen, you know you're ignorant and you can be pig headed, and um, she just was gave me some really good education on, on what I needed, and I just wasn't ready to receive it as often <laughs> teenagers are, um, you know. And so I think back to some of the things that he was saying, and he was right. But I just uh, I wasn't ready to sort of hear it, and so I have a good relationship with him now. But uh, at the time, I was like, "Oh God, what are you talking about? These rhymes <laughs> and riddles? I don't, know. I don't know. Understand? Give me a straight answer." <laughs> was it was there similar with Mick? Yeah, Mick. Mick was pretty hard. I remember he used to yell at me and abuse me and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, you get your back up and like, fuck, well, give us a spell. I, you know, like Job said, like I thought I knew best, and I was, yeah. when I was playing in reserve, reserves, running around, not getting a kick, and I was like. <laughs> I know more than this AFL legend, but one day he was going off at me. I was playing in the ones, I think, and he um he's, we're in a meeting. He's like, mate, you know, I don't know, Swan, I don't know why anyone wants to play with you. Like you're killing your teammate. Showed vision of me, whatever it was, and I walked out. I was like, oh, you can get fucked, like. And then like Jono said to me, he goes, mate, um, if he's yelling at you, he means. He cares because see the blokes he's not yelling at, they'll be gone at the end of the year. So, like, um, if he's hard on you, he knows that you can be something. So that sort of turned my thinking around. I was like, well, he actually cares or understands that he can get something out of me by giving it to me because some of the blokes, like, I'd be like, fucking look at this bloke. Like, he's, a, he's horrible. Like, he's doing something wrong. So he's fucking hopeless. Yeah. But he's not getting yelled at. He's getting pat on the back. <laughs> but at the end of the year, he was gone. And yeah. somehow I managed to fucking stay. But... Um, yeah, he was super hard on me, but uh, you know, like exactly what Job said, I didn't think I needed it, but he obviously was right, and he was one. Must have been the only one who'd seen anything in me down in the reserves that I was going to be any good. So um, he obviously saw something in me which which no one else did, not even myself. So um, yeah, I everything the player I was, whether he thought I was good or bad, to to me because he moulded me the player I was put me down back, put me up forward and then and let me go in the midfield. Mm. Does that give you some memories similarly? Yeah, I think it, 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 it it's like what a great coach does, isn't it? They, they see something in a player and then they help nurture it and they understand what the trigger point is going to be to get them. And they never, you know, like they can be hard on you, but they never lo- you never lose the player. You know, yeah. like you sort of, it's like a father almost. They give you these whacks, but then you always want to, um, do something you want to make them proud, or you want to yeah. perform for them because you know that deep down there, there's they're invested in you and they care. And I think that that's what those great coaches were. They're able to find um, something inside the, the players to make them want to perform for them. Yeah, it's, they obviously the legendary coaches had a way of all right. This bloke needs a carrot. This bloke needs a stick. So yeah. it's like some blokes, oh fuck you! I'll show you that yeah. I can go out and do this and like. Some blokes didn't react that way. Some blokes would go into their shells when they got yeah, it's all right. He needs to be he needs to be given the carrot and be yeah. like told you you going okay. I'll, Mick obviously thought I needed the stick, so <laughs> um, I copped the stick quite a few times. But yeah, that's the way you react. All right, well, fuck yeah, I reckon I can do that. Yeah, I'll fucking show you. And yeah. then you'd go, you know, you'd sort of walk off the ground at the end of the game. Well, I can stick that up your ass, Mick. Like yeah. well, I did that, and then you know, only after you finished or once you've become a regular senior player, you're like, oh well. That's actually what he was trying to do the whole time instead yeah. of 
you know what well, they obviously had a method behind their madness which like Job said, as young kids, you have no idea about. You just think he's yelling at you just because he's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, they have their they have their reasons. And that, that's the difficult thing I think about the AFL system is you're so young when you enter it. Yeah. Um, and the, the the knowledge that you gain, like by the time you're 24, you think, oh god, I sort of wasted you know those first six years because I just didn't know. And you're not supposed to know when you're that young. Uh, and that's that's I think where it's a bit different in, in in the NFL where you come into the system and you're 23, 24, and you've had to you've had to build these levels of um, work ethic to get there in the first place and get through college and and all that sort of stuff. So you go there and you sort of hit the ground running. Where in the AFL you you're just like these na- naive little kids, and, and nor should you really know anything. You're 18 years old. You just got out of school. Yeah. Like what are you supposed to do? This is professional of the world. It's it's a difficult sort of uh, thing to walk into. Do you think the age limit should be lifted? I reckon it should be. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, <coughs> I think it for, for twofold. One that it um, you know physically and, and, and mentally, I think it would really help uh, guys adjust. Um, and the two, I think that 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 year or two where you finished school and went into the system, I think it would get you a great perspective on other aspects of life and the appreciation of going into the football environment I think would be higher. Guys who didn't um, uh, who didn't have long careers had already started something or learnt or worked out, okay, I like this, I don't like this. Because I think a lot of guys get to the end of their careers and they just don't know what they like or what they don't like. Yeah. And, and, and not everyone has the opportunity to take two or three years to work that out. You know, like I think you, you finish your career and you've got a mortgage, you've got to do something, you've got to get a job, but I didn't really think about it, I don't know this, I don't know that. And so you get forced into something that you don't really want to do and then you get ups, uh, unhappy about that, which is very natural. Um, so I think that there's merit in that sort of self-discovery of that period when you're 18 to 20. Because well, the average bloke in the... Or, or, or lady, uh, they, it's common to have a gap year, travel the world, and all that. You don't get that luxury if you're a professional sportsman. No, no, no. You, that, that's one of the things you don't you don't have. But I, and I think you don't have. I never really asked myself the question of what, what is it that I like, what is it that I want to do. You know, I didn't ask myself that question enough when I was playing. I got you know you caught up with next week, or I've got to do this, I've got to do that, so I've got to do this, but. I think that that's sort of the, the question to help formulate the next path of your life is who am I, what do I like to do, what could make me happy, what am I interested in? Um, and that, that will, I, I think, it helps to bridge that leaving the game and feeling lost, which I think a lot of people go through in any elite sport. Um, Anzac Day, talk, talk us through the highlights and obviously you would have shared the centre square with Swanee plenty of times. Yeah, yeah, we used to line up on each other a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. Just at stoppages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'd go back. So Dave's got low and then say Sorry to yeah. interrupt, but Dave's gotta to, got to say you, you can't win Brownlow's having good defensive pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so. No. The uh well that, that's the thing. You should, I used to sort of always say to the guys, listen, do you want the ball in your hands or you want it in mine? Exactly. You guys make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, Anzac Day, is, it's a really special, it's a special, special game. It's the one game that I miss the most of playing yeah. and it's just the build up to it, the silence before the the, gra- uh, the game starts mm-hmm. and then just the roar. Like I just never hear such passion in a crowd than when it was either Collingwood or Essendon. Like it yeah. just felt like <laughs> what it must have felt like to be, you know, like in the Colosseum in Rome. Like that, you know, and that just this amphitheatre of... Um, Emotion and, and energy, like it was just extraordinary. Yes, it is. It's um, Sheeds again, just yep. genius, created it. Um, yeah, it's an incredible day. And I've always said every time <coughs> I speak about it, so like, even if you don't bury for Collingwood or Essendon, <coughs> you have to go at least one day and stay till the first five minutes, you know, see the, the last post and the anthem and the ceremony before the game and then um, the roar at the start, then the first five minutes, and then if you don't like both sides, you can leave. But um, yeah, but it's an incredible, it's an incredible day. Um, yeah, they, the games always sort of produce sort of decentish games, so no matter where the two sides are on the ladder. But another one of Sheeds' awesome inventions, and yeah. um, so you played at Dreamtime the Jays, well, due to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that was another one. You know, like just something so simple as the, the colours of the f- Aboriginal flag. 
at the colours of the two teams. You know, like yeah. that's that's how his mind worked. Okay, and he thought, yeah. okay, there's there is something in the, this that we can then take and, and create a, a, a game around, mm-hmm. and which then created everything else that is part of it. And now it's such a significant day um, in 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 Australia and in the sporting world, but um, in the community as well. And and that that foresight and that lateral thinking, I think, is what made him such a great ambassador for the game. I was just thinking while we're talking about him that Swanee earlier this year said about how would you like to be taking over from Ed as Mark Quarter when you were giving yep. support to Mark Quarter it's impossible in hindsight now that you've got the benefit of hindsight that would have been a tough gig for Matthew Knight sometimes. yeah yeah very tough very tough gig and I always thought that probably at the time the club was under resourced and yep. so a first time coach coming in <coughs> to an under resourced sort of football department was a recipe for disaster um, and you know Knight has gone on and had a really successful assistant coach career at Geelong and he had some great um, you know uh, thoughts on the game and how it should be played but um, I think that that he and anyone who was you know making those decisions at that time would have said okay well I'm probably not ready and this infrastructure around me is not ready to support someone coming into this role as a first time coach and, and, and given your belief and, and love of American sports if we're looking at how many uh, guys who have gone amiss if uh, problem use a horse racing saying, but yeah. a, a, as a young coach yeah you actually do need that real long apprenticeship don't you i mean it's what he had to play nathan early doors and he kept on improving as a coach but years later yeah well, that's right it's just it's natural to, to you don't know um you, you know a hell of a lot more in year five or six or something than you do in year one or two yeah. um and I think that the the problem is that the you know we, we're so used to having immediate satisfaction. You know, life has become about immediate satisfaction, and that's tr- trickled into our expectations for the teams that we support. You know, we want immediate results. We want immediate um, things to change. So that pressure just becomes more and more amplified for the people in those positions. Uh, on the good side, I, I spent a year with Hurdy a couple of years back doing a podcast. And uh, how's that going? I, I think it's still in delay. <laughs> I think we're, I'm expecting a call back any any minute. But uh, it was great fun, and um, and some of his thoughts on the game were unbelievable. What was the good side of his coaching like before things went to shit? Yeah, Hurdy's a great manager of people. You know, like as a captain, he was. Um, I had a great relationship. You know, I loved playing under him. He was sort of one of those guys, a bit like you know what Swanee was talking about with Mick. You're like, you really wanted to you know play well for him, or you wanted to impress him, that sort of thing. He had that aura about him, and and he was able to uh, cultivate that feeling. Like he wasn't demonstrative demonstrative about it he nurtured it you know and yep. I think it's a real skill from a management side of things um, you've got someone who's got such a big uh, presence but uh, never felt like it was um, you know overbearing or that he, he you know it, w- he, you couldn't connect with him I, I found like I thought he was really good at manage- uh, management side of things um, and he had some good thoughts on the, the game as well but you know I think that that's the, the biggest strength as any coach is you have to be able to manage people because you've got all these different personalities mm-hmm. they have to be able to all you have to find something that connects you to them and that was what his skill was and what was your mindset as a, as a captain once became captain. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was tried to, to do something sort of similar where um, that, that relationship, I had to be able to connect with every person in the locker room in some form. You know, it had to be, whether I had nothing in common with them, I had to find something, uh, a common ground um, because I needed them to want to play with me um, and wanted to be part of the team. I needed them to, to give every... It couldn't just be about their own career. Like, it couldn't be about them just having their best own individual career. They had to feel like they were part of something. And that was based off a, a connection I felt was... if I if the, As the captain, if you could make a connection with them in some form, then they would be feel, they would feel part of the collective. And that was the, the key to building a, a strong team. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. You never kept them though. 
I was in the leadership squad, the leadership team. Um, but no, I no, it wasn't for me. They you did too much extra work, like <laughs> unpaid. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was in the, I was in the, I think I was vice captain for a couple of years. But in the end, I went into Mick and said, "Listen, you might as well give it to someone else because the, the didn't change me." Yeah. So like I was, I, I think when people get voted in the leadership group, it changes some people for the better. Obviously, like some people go right. I'm a captain. I need to stand. Up, I need to lead. I need to be more vocal at training. I need to show. I need to um, lead by example. I need to do this. Where I didn't change. Like I was, whether it was for better or for worse. But I was the same person. So I was like, well, you might as well give it to someone else who actually might benefit from it because I'm the same person I was yesterday that I am today in the leadership group so you might as well give it to someone else so it didn't not that it, leadership didn't sit well with me I thought I sort of led on on field by example and stuff and the way I, I played but it didn't change me in my off field stuff and um, I wasn't super vocal at training stuff like that so you might as well give it to someone else who who actually wants to roll and, and I guess the other thing was is like it's hard to punish people when you're probably right there next to them yeah. <laughs> or, on, the, on the weekends you know like you know, and I guess I was probably I was probably the the leak in the leadership team, you know what I mean? Like we'd have a meeting and like some, say when when Steele and Blairy were out and we were gonna get punished and I was there with them. But I didn't get caught, so I was like, Well fuck And it's hard to it's hard to sit there and go, Well, you fucked you up Steel. Yeah, it's like <laughs> You fucked up, mate, Blairy. Um shouldn't have been out drinking, like and I'm like sitting there going, oh, fuck, I was there. So that was sort of when, well, you know what? It's And I like, you go out and say, boys, you know, like, they know you were there. Yeah. So like, don't deny it. Or sometimes I'd be like, well, they don't, we don't know you were there. So like, you can get away with it. You know what I mean? So I probably, I probably didn't help the fucking side. Like, go together. But, but we were very successful. Well, we weren't very successful. We weren't successful. We won one flag. But yeah, it probably wasn't for me because I was, and I didn't like to see anyone punished for anything. Like I was more like, well, as long as you play well and train well, mm-hmm. you know, that's all I, I care about. But yeah, so that's probably why my leadership skills were lacking because I'd be like, boys, <laughs> they know, we know, well, we don't know anything. So even though I know you were there, they don't. So just deny it and they can't prove it. So you won't get in trouble. Or, <laughs> that's leadership right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> different, different kind. Or, um, you know, or listen, you fuck, we know... They all know you were there, so yeah, just come in a minute. Say you were doing this, and you're gonna cop a fucking week suspension, or you're gonna cop going to the Bart Beach at six a.m. or whatever, you know, whatever the punishment was. So, um, yeah, leadership really wasn't for me. I think if you got a welfare though, <laughs> like, I think I would because I've done and experienced as many as most. So, um, I think I would be. There's a potential earner in that, I would think. Well, nothing's for nothing, Ralph. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. But um, I think I could be a good year to talk to, but um, but yeah, that's it. Because it's a fine line, isn't it? If, if 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 someone has mucked up at a young age, do you want the... the uh, well, I was going to say Matthew Lloyd. <laughs> do you want the up and down straight citizen or do you want someone who actually knows what it's like to fuck up? You need a bit of both. <laughs> you, need, yeah. uh, you can't because... Someone who's never done anything wrong and hasn't made any mistakes can't. He can. They can't understand yes. how people put themselves in that situation. They they can't empathise, and so all their decision making is based off only the things that they would do. Yep. So you need. That's why a group is helpful. You know, like we because yeah. you've got different ter- types of personalities. <coughs> um, we used to. Uh, one of the uh, players, we had a group of guys who, who, who mucked up and they had to go and see Bomber. And Bomber was a real intimidating bloke, like a scary sort of guy. And Bomber put them all in, in different rooms and would just go from each room <laughs> and get a story and say, this bloke said this about you, what, what's happened? And so they all crumbled and they, they lasted about five minutes before they just coughed up what had happened. But he was the old police sort of interrogating, separated, <laughs> divided cooker. John Owen Tazza got an old punch on. At, um, when Mick said no one was allowed out and they obviously went out. Taz had gotten a punch on Johnny came out and helped him. And Mix and they had to go in the next morning and um, Maxi Klein and the footy manager said, you are not allowed to talk to Mick and look at him for one week. 
<laughs> like, and like when he mean like he absolutely people they weren't allowed to make eye contact with Mick for one week. <laughs> like, that was their punishment. Like, they got suspended for a week and they weren't allowed to. <laughs> he um, be so, like, literally not about not allowed to make eye contact with him for one week, and then that was the end of the year. They, they called in. Um, he called called Tazza a cunt and traded him at the end of the year, and then he's called Jono a fuckhead and just a fuck up, and then obviously Jono stayed. But yeah, so that was his punishment. Like you were not allowed to look at him for one way. That's how angry he was. <laughs> so that, that was their punishment. Who was the bombers? Yeah, Red, Red we, Pack. We we had a we had a few different times. This is a, a funny story. There was a fight one night um, between Essendon and Collingwood. I think it's billboards, um, and I reckon it might have been. I don't. I can't remember who was involved, but Jay, uh, might have been Mark Johnson from Essendon. And I think it was Tazza. Tazza? I think yeah. they got in a punch on it, um, billboards. So we're sitting in, uh, we're like an auditorium on the Monday morning and everyone knew about it. Um, so Sheeds gets up and he says, right, every person that was at billboards on Saturday <laughs> night, get up and sit over this side of the room. <laughs> so 80% of the group stood up. <laughs> <laughs> moved over to the other side of the room. And then poor old uh, Teddy Richards, who's a good mate of mine, he, he sort of said, oh, he just stood up, he said, Look, oh, I was there, but I was there for 10 minutes. <laughs> he goes, get over there, Richards. <laughs> so we had all kinds of characters doing uh, that. Who was, your, who was your main group of uh, the Swanee equivalent of a Rat Pack? Uh, uh, yeah, early on... Um, Sort of probably uh, some funny guys. Solly? Mark, yeah, Solly, Solly McVeigh, um, Ramanaskis. Um, they were sort of a, a bit of a rat pack, Mark Johnson. And then when I got older, I had to be careful with Tommy Bell Chambers, where he was, Sammy <laughs> Lonigan, uh, Tate Pears. <laughs> Uh, those sort of guys were Michael. Michael Hibbard was a con, he was a constant like throughout my whole career, uh, but he he was always so funny his story. So I sort of had a soft spot for him. Geez, it changed though because when when did you get drafted? Uh, o, o two. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I was o one. But like I remember the boys, like, the Shaw brothers, the Cloaks, like, and a handful of others. Like imagine doing this now. They got into a punch on on a Wednesday night at the half on the piss <laughs> and got pepper sprayed like during. <laughs> Like during the footy seat, like during your game, like during the footy seat, like could you imagine the boy, like you'd be, you'd all be sacked. Yeah, they'd sack you on the spot, yeah. wouldn't they? Like, yeah, but the the problem was that they weren't out. Yeah, it was the problem was they got all punch on and got police. So I was like, like how funny, like what ten years later, like if a group of blokes got pinged at the pub on a Wednesday oh, night, that, that's enough to be sacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah like ten of years, but it wasn't the fact that I oh, probably was a bit they were out late, but. Been at a pub having a few beers on a Wednesday before a Saturday was sort of, you know, it wasn't okay, but it wasn't a sackable offence. Nah. But it was the fact that they got pepper sprayed and got an all punch on. The, the punishment that we had was we all had to be in the, the whole team, obviously, you get punished as one. You had to be in like at 6 a.m., say, like the fucking next day or the day after. And they, which, which is probably topical now because of the boxing rule, it's not allowed. Yeah. We had, so we all, all the so six of them that got, uh, that were at the pub. Um, they had uh, two boxing gloves. They had obviously a set of boxing gloves on and they had to fight two blokes with one glove on each. <laughs> and, mate, and they got absolutely hammered. Like, talk about concussions. Uh, I won't name names, but one of them started to cry and then got his old man down. His old man come down and complained. Um, mate, it was a shit show. But it was Just like, in saying that, I've got someone at about $1.40. Yeah. <laughs> um, brothers, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, mate. My some of the part, like so, and because the boys were pretty pissed off, they're like, "Fuck, fuck yeah. you! Been here at six in the morning. I'm going to show you." And like, <laughs> two blokes just like hit them as hard as they can go. <laughs> like it was, and I was like, oh, oh, thank fuck, I wasn't there Wednesday night. But um, <laughs> like, that's how much the world's changed. Like, yeah. and I, even some of the senior blokes were going out on going to frostbite on a Thursday night. Yeah, playing at the MCG on a Saturday. Like, you did that now. Someone, one person takes a photo. That's your career's done. Your career's like, done. Yeah, yeah. But the, from, crime, the the punishment to the crime is is outweighed now much so yeah. much more, isn't it? You know, like yeah. um, you get sacked by Twitter before you arrive at the club. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. That's what that sort of yeah. happens. So it's just um, that's how um, uh, amplified everything has become. Yeah, it's wild. Actually, speaking of that, so Dane, you've been a bit active this week, and congratulations! You you, you decided to do Dry July. Yeah, I did from the thirty first. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
It was tough. Well, if I had known we were going back into lockdown, I would have I would have broken that. But I had a few last night. I had the the Last Supper, um, six point oh. Yep. Well, Jesus I only had one, um, but we've had six. But but yeah, um, stayed dry July for for a night, which was which is nice. But well done. Um, we're proud of you, mate. You know what? I don't know what. <laughs> but you're, you're you're a tad less active on Twitter. I think your last tweet was eighteen months ago. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very <laughs> infrequent. Uh, <laughs> do you scroll on it or? Yeah, I look at it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I love um, I like the N- NFL and, and yeah, all yeah. sorts of stuff. So I, I like to to look at it. I just don't really. We don't have a TV. Interested. Fucking what else do you do at home? <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading books by, <laughs> by candlelight. <laughs> yeah, books with a lost quill again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just want to. Uh, so I, I first met you uh, when you were about seventeen or eighteen because Essien's first year. Yep. I was producer from about halfway through, and we and this Tim changed my life in this way. So it was it was Gary, Billy, the Tim, Rod Law, who's program manager, me. I, that could have been it. Just he had a barbecue <laughs> at your place. Yep. No pizza oven. It pizza oven. Have, yeah. Fired that up too. Yeah. Yeah. So about three hours in, and where's Tim? He actually left his own. <laughs> Backyard Bobby just to go upstairs because he had enough of people talking. <laughs> and I, there was, does that shock you? <laughs> that does not shock me one bit. Like if you, if you'd, it would shock you that someone who has lived a public life the entire for his whole adult life since he's fifteen years old um, would leave his own barbecue to go upstairs. Like that is a very frequent occurrence. <laughs> and there's a reason why he goes to down to the farm as much as he can and. And it is completely isolated, which is the way he likes it. <laughs> I think he bought the farm while I was working with him at the time. So it's yeah, Gippsland Way and down in Gippsland. Yeah. Use it a bit as well. Is yeah, he's got the he's got the vines in there, so he's very um, particular about his grapes and things like that. He makes his own wine. And, uh, How is it? Yeah, it's very good actually. It's very good. He's what is it? Dumb luck. It's uh, it's a Fiano, which is a white. Um, he's actually just started to stock it in a very select really? couple of places. Yeah, yeah, so he's quite proud of it. What's that. it called? Give him. It's a called Mary's Vineyard. Mary's Vineyard, which is uh, my mother's mum. Uh, oh. That was her name. Yeah. Because the other one, and it was, it's it's related to that. I mean, so when you're doing breakfast radio, you you um afterwards you you go out for a coffee yeah. for an hour and H- talk. How to long you. do you do breakfast radio for? He's done it. So he started. Uh, it's him. Uh, Two thousand four was the first, first year. Yeah, 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 the first year. Eighteen years. Eighteen years. Yeah, he had a couple years off, and now he's back to. I lasted him. twelve weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a segment guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your shift? <laughs> oh well, it varied from seven till. Anywhere from seven AM to eight forty five AM on a Monday morning. Yeah, Mondays aren't for me. No, no, no <laughs> not the right. They chose the wrong day. Of the Monday, week. I says Tuesday to Friday. I'm all good. <laughs> Monday mornings are tough. Like, I don't know how your old man's done. I, I didn't. I didn't last a footy season. <laughs> and he's done eighteen years. Incredible stuff. Incredible yeah. stuff. So it, we'd, we'd usually chat for an hour, and it, the talk sheet actually yeah. time was important because yeah. I mean, you know, unlike I don't know, let's say most workplaces, it's, it's about the next day, but as well as talking shit, and. I remember Bill would average, Brownless would average four to six sportsman's nights a week, <laughs> even though he was getting up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and I remember Tim saying, oh, I don't often give out public, uh, private conversation, but he, he was just in marvel because he said, whenever someone twists his arm to do a public talk, which is rare, yeah. he'd be anxious about it for five weeks leading into it. And he's going, Look at Bill, just fine. <laughs> just <laughs> off it the back loves there. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he's never. I don't know where he, I mean, but he's a he's an atypical uh, introvert, you know. Yeah. Like that, that's his personality type. Um, and, and then a couple of years afterwards, at an Irvine club, which I'm part of, he was the speaker. He is as good as anyone, yeah. and he's because it starts with his stuff in Dimbula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, how Western had recruited him. <laughs> I think it's They'll probably got something him. to do with being a 15 year old getting exposed <laughs> as a 15 year old. I think that's had a lasting influence on him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a quick one to finish. Uh, so uh, we've done Anzac Day. Just whatever you want to say, Kevin Sheedy. Yeah, well, he's an icon of the game, Sheets. Yeah. And although I had some uh, bumps in the road with him, I have an appreciation for him after. He loves a sportsman's night. He, he's a good sportsman's <laughs> night operator. Yeah, yeah. Jeezy, pa- he brings some stuff too. Yeah. He backs the truck up with his jumpers <laughs> and books and paintings. Oh, mate, absolutely. Yeah. He's always got a Sharpie on hand. <laughs> <Hadn't> he? Yeah. <laughs> Herdy the player. Yeah, I heard he was my idol, you know, as a, as a kid. So he was an unbelievable player. Is he the best you played with? Yeah, he was the best player I played with. Yeah. yeah. Heard he the coach? 
Well, before everything that happened, Hurdy was a, was a great coach, and I think he was going along that track. And then, uh, you know, he, like a lot of people who were heavily involved in it, um, you know, it was became debilitating to him. Yeah. Yep. Matty Lloyd? Uh, Lloyd is the funniest bloke I, I know that doesn't try to be funny. <laughs> You're laughing at him or with him? Most of the time, it's a, it's a mixture of both. But he's a very, very funny guy, Lloyd. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Fletch? Uh, Fletch, very laid back, um, but had an, a, a great ability to connect with people 20 years his junior. Like, he's a very, very easygoing guy, good person to be around. How did he play for so long? It's well, I think, it's, I think it was his, like, personality type where yeah. nothing bothered him. He just got on with things. Um, How was he on the track? No, nah, it wasn't <laughs> a huge track. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a big sort of track operator. He waited yeah. until the balls came out. Yeah, but it, like he, he was one of those guys that every person respected and loved who played with him. You know, like every person who came in the club because he just treated everyone the same. You know, he was just such a nice, nice person. And and, and just to finish, we get like we had an hour of fun for people in lockdown who were doing it tough. When all of a sudden you can't do what you want to do, it ain't fun. So, what were some of the coping me- mechanisms you, you went through when you had to stop? Yeah, um, I mean, I, me- I remember I went, after I got banned. You know, I was obviously really um, flat and, and, and really struggling with it. And, and I, I went down to the farm, you know, by myself, and, and I wrote a list of things that I wanted to do in that next twelve months and things that I hadn't done before and um, new experiences, but just almost like a, a bit of a goal setting for myself. Um, and then I tried to, to tick that off, tried to take myself out of my comfort zone. But it was about, um, you know, understanding that difficult things happen to everyone and it's just what you do with them and then how you can respond out of them. And um, I think that this, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of people are really hurting out there and it's it's very, very sad to see, um, you know, what, what's, what's happened to a lot of people and, and there's a lot of... Um, you know, uh, there's care and, and people can reach out to things and, and make an effort to, to go and um, speak to someone if they need help. Did you no. get many off your list? I did tick everything off my <laughs> list. <laughs> All right. yep. oh, I want to. I'll, I will finish with one here. Cause, so you gave Joby's Brownlow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Literally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the night. Because um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the cutaway and there's Dado comes out and puts the medal on and then let's all toast uh, Joe Watson for winning the Brownlow. You're still there for the drink. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> it's my moment. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I was up. Bruce loved it. <laughs> He's an air genius. Yeah, oh, the best. Fantastic. If you had a TV, you'd be watching some of it. I'd know. But, uh, <laughs> I'd just have to take it a second hand. Still haven't got my head around that. <laughs> Good stuff, mate. Appreciate you doing it. No problem. Thanks, Thanks guys. mate. Cheers. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. I'm Alan Crossley, and as a certified master hypnotist and NLP practitioner, I know a thing or two about helping people to relax. If you've ever had trouble falling asleep, we'd like to invite you to listen to the Tracks to Relax Guided Sleep Meditations podcast. Join the millions of people who've put an end to occasional insomnia, and discover just how easy it is to relax deeply and fall asleep fast at bedtime. Reduce stress and get the rest you deserve by listening to a soothing sleep meditation tonight. The Tracks to Relax Guided Sleep Meditations podcast really is the most relaxing way to end your day. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST recommends.